until now, we've just kind of assumed that the nervous system was already built and put together. Neurons had already turned into neurons and formed synapses. But of course, we all arise from a single cell. This turns into a little ball of cells. It turns into a disc that'll have two, then about three layers. We'll then distinguish uh, that outer ectodermal layer into future neurons and future epidermis. Those future neurons are going to go through uh, neurulation to separate off from the out overlying epidermis. And then they'll have to figure out whether they're at the head or the tail, the bottom or the top. After that, some cells have to turn into neurons, others have to turn into glio. Newborn neurons might have to migrate just a little bit, or they might have to migrate for some distance to uh, reach their final destination. Once they're there, they'll have to grow their dendrites and their axons. They'll have to encounter their pre- and post-synaptic partners, form functional synapses. And then finally, we cut the fat. We kill off the excess cells that were created to ensure complete uh, innervation of the body. And those that didn't form functional synapses get removed. And that's what this unit is about. Now this first lecture is just about the induction of neural cell fates. How do we determine what's going to be a neuron versus skin or what's going to be a neuron versus a glial cell? We'll touch just a bit on migration. Um, we'll hit this more whenever we talk about axon growth because it's the same basic process. That is, stick out some actin filaments, see where you can stick, and then pull yourself in that direction. Neural induction is going to be caused by the release of proteins that affect gene expression. These proteins can be actually released, as in they diffuse away from the cell, or they can be stuck into the surface so that two cells that touch can talk to each other. In the end, what we'll be doing is affecting the expression of proneural genes. If we turn them on, we'll have a neuron, and if we turn them off, we won't. That's going to come down to delta and notch signaling. And then finally we'll touch a bit on neurogenesis in the cortex, the ganglionic eminences, and then throughout adulthood. Cells, of course, don't really know where they are. They have to figure it out by listening to their neighbors. And the way that their neighbors are going to talk to them is by releasing some sort of diffusible factor. It's going to create a gradient. When you're near the cells releasing that factor, you have a high concentration, and as you move further away, you have a lower concentration. So based on the exposure to different diffusible factors, neurons can figure out where they are in the body. Now cells, uh, let's see, so we begin our life as a single cell, that would be the zygote. This is going to go through a few rounds of cell division. It'll form a, a morula eventually. This will continue to divide uh, until we form a blastula, which is just a ball of cells, a hollow ball of cells for the most part. So there's the outer trophectoderm. That's going to form the placenta. And then there's the inner cell mass that forms everything else. The inner cell mass is going to make uh, all of the embryonic tissues will also form the yolk sac that will feed the embryo until that uh, placenta gets formed. We're going to kind of breeze through this so that that uh, blastula there, whether it's a disc in mammals or kind of more of a ball in amphibians, is going to go through gas relation. We're going to go from about two layers to three. There's going to be a little movie of gas relation playing here, and I'm going to focus more on amphibians because that's where most of the work has been done. But there's the same basic principles. So we have this site of invagination. So we're going to go from a ball of cells into basically a tube. Now for mammals, we're going to go from a disc to a multilayered disc. So we'll have about two layers. Here's that inner cell mass here. And we'll just have cells move inward and invaginate. We're going to create something called a primitive streak, where cells are going to start to migrate inward. 
They're going to form then the mesoderm. So this outer layer will be the ectoderm. This inner layer, the endoderm. And we're going to fill in this space with mesoderm. So those cells that migrate inward are going to create that third layer there. So here's our new inwardly migrating cells. These used to live out here. They came inward and we're left with a streak. And if we were to look down on that streak, we'd see our disc. So there's that inner cell mass. And it would have bilateral symmetry at this point. And there'd be an organizer, that primitive node. But what we're going to do is go from basically two cells, two cell layers into that three germ layer structure. So when this is all done, what we'll look like is basically a three layer disc. Where we have the ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. <clears throat> the site of gas relation is called either the, the, the blastophore or the primitive streak. So in amphibians, there at the, door, uh, at the blastophore, there's an organizer structure called the dorsal blastophore lip. And at the primitive streak, there's a primitive node where we get that invagination. So once we have our three germ layers, what we then need to do is figure out which part of the ectoderm is going to be nervous tissue. This is going to be determined by organizer cells. And these are going to have a few names depending on the species and the, the scientists who studied it. But they do the same thing. What organizers do is start to create those body axes. They're going to tell other cells around them what to become. Now there's not just one static set of organizer cells. Cells will move out of the organizer, cells can move back into it, so this is a dynamic structure. There's the spemen organizer in amphibians, uh, which has been studied a lot more extensively than in uh, birds and mammals. In birds and mammals that have that sort of disc uh, embryo is called the primitive node. Cells there are going to spit out diffusible factors. They're going to create a concentration gradient around them that's going to tell the tissues where they are. And that's going to help us create body axes. So if you look at the illustration there, what that's showing us is they're going to take two embryos and here's the site of invagination here. This is where we would go through that uh, gastrulation, they take that out of one and they'll just put it in the wrong spot. So if here's the dorsal portion where we're going to have gastrulation, they'll put that new one over here. So when they move the organizer over, now we have our built-in organizer. That's our primary organizer, but now we'll have a secondary one. So these cells, just by moving those organizer cells over, what you end up with, if you go down through development, you're going to have two complete body axes. So they're going to have their conjoined newts as a result. And that's because there were two organizers. So we're going to be organizing the tissue around both of these. They're going to be spitting out diffusible factors. that will create a very high concentration gradient near lower as you move away, and we're going to be specifying then two different bodies because there are now two organizers there. What we're going to be spitting out, what these little dots represent, are going to be uh, uh, BMP inhibitors. So bone morphogenic protein uh, is a member of the, the TGF-beta superfamily of uh, morphogens. BMP signaling is going to affect gene expression. So what it's going to do is stimulate ectodermal cell fates. It's going to repress the expression of proneural genes. Now every cell is going to be 
uh, spitting out uh, BMPs. So every cell is going to be bathed with uh, BMP, and as a result, kind of the default is going to be ectoderm. The reason that we think this is because removing portions of that future nervous system and taking them away from the organizer. So let's take uh, let's take away a piece of this. What would have been? So here's our organizer here. We're going to remove other cells, and we'll just grow them. And if you grow them as a little flap of cells all together, what you get is a piece of skin. On the other hand, if you chop them up. and dissociate them into single cells and spread them out so that they're not exposed to all the BMP that their neighbor is spitting out, what you get is a whole bunch of neurons. So the default pathway is going to be turn into a neuron, but when we're near our neighbors, we are told become skin. So what we need to do is remove that BMP input to allow basically the default. Because if you were to bathe these dissociated cells here in some BMP to recreate what happens when they're touching their neighbors, that gives you skin again. And if you genetically repress BMP signaling by expressing dominant negative uh, BMP receptors, no more induction of epidermis. So that spemin organizer right here, what this is doing is creating a gradient of BMP inhibitors. So when you're near the organizer, very high level of BMP inhibitors. Noggin is a, a great example. Cordin, folostatin, cerebrus. These will bind to BMPs. So these little diffusible factors that are floating around that the cells are spitting out. What these proteins do is bind them up so that they can't stimulate their receptor. So cells that are near the organizer then get induced with a neural cell fate. Now we're going to be affecting, of course, epidermis, mesoderm as well. We're going to need to create that notochord, and the organizer is going to help with that. So if we overexpress BMP, that's what we're looking at here, well then development doesn't go normally. We're not developing neural structures anymore. Instead it's just a big ball of skin that develops on top there. And what we're seeing here is that um, in the whole embryo, whenever you keep it all together, they're looking at the expression of neural genes on the bottom there. For example, a neural cell adhesion molecule. So in the whole embryo, you'll see expression of that, but in the animal cap, isolated all by itself, we're not seeing the expression of neural genes until they add on, look at those uh, two columns on the right there, whenever they take this and they add BMP inhibitors, either Gordon or Noggin, and remember these are BMP inhibitors that prevents us from forming skin and instead we form neurons. So we see the upregulation of neural genes. So those BMP receptors, these are a little uh, unique. Rather than being receptor tyrosine kinases, these are receptor uh, ser uh, serine kinases. So usually receptors are going to be tyrosine kinases and the kinases that are soluble will be serine. But this one's a little bit different. So when BMP binds, same idea though, the receptor is going to dimerize there and it'll phosphorylate itself. The other thing that'll phosphorylate is a transcription factor called SMAD1. Once phosphorylated, we get dimerization occurring. Then we have functional transcription factors, so SMAD1 and SMAD4 will dimerize together. That'll allow them to actually bind to the DNA and affect the expression of genes. And what the SMADs are going to do is cause neural uh, repression 
and the activation of epidermal genes. So that's going to push us toward a skin cell fate. So in this case, SMAD signaling is going to induce skin and repress neuron. And the SMADs are activated by BMPs. So the BMT inhibitors prevent activation of SMAD. We no longer repress neural cell fate, and we no longer stimulate epidermal cell fate. And as a result, we form neurons. There's probably a few more proteins involved, and you can have a look at that illustration if you'd like, but that's the basic system. BMT binds to receptor. Receptor stimulates a, uh, a transcription factor, and that transcription factor then affects what genes are expressed. So once we have kind of determined what's going to be neural, what's going to be uh, skin, we have to figure out where are we. So there's, there's going to be other organizers that are going to help us know front and back. So anterior, posterior, and then top and bottom, dorsal and ventral. One structure that's really important for this is going to be the axial mesendoderm. So this is going to be derived from the organizer, and it's going to serve as an organizer. It's going to be uh, right underneath the neural plate. This is going to be our notochord. So the notochord is another organizer. The notochord is found at midline. And this is a great place to make your nervous system. All of our nervous systems are right on midline. This is where we want to create our brain and spinal cord. So, we have our kind of three-layered structure. And that axial mesendoderm, so right here, right near the midline, this is going to act as an organizer. So anything that's near midline is going to know that it's there because it's going to receive higher doses of this. So we're going to jump ahead here and go through neurulation. We'll explain this in just a little bit. But that's where we separate the neural tube and we have our notochord down here. This is our neural tube. So someday this is going to form spinal cord or brain. So the notochord is going to spit out some diffusible factors to help distinguish that dorsal and uh, uh, ventral axis. And it's going to do that with some BMP inhibitors. It'll also be doing it early on. So high level of BMP inhibition right here in the center. And that's going to cause this to form the neural plate. That neural plate eventually forms the neural tube. But even in the neural tube, we still know where we're at because of this gradient of diffusible factors. When you have a higher dose, that means you're in the ventral portions, and lower doses, dorsal. And this will help determine our dorsal ventral axis. Earlier on, it was more of the medial lateral axis, so midline to the sides, and then dorsal ventral. The anterior-posterior axis is going to be through Wnt inhibitors. So the anterior portions of this, axial mesendoderm, those are going to spit out uh, the Wnt inhibitors. The, the anterior uh, axial mesendoderm is also going to have Wnt receptors that will compete for Wnt binding with the overlying future neural cells. So let me turn this so we can see different parts. So here's our disc. And I'm going to draw the axial mesendoderm under it like that. So rather than specifying midline or the side, dorsal ventral, what we're going to be doing here is having the anterior portion so future brain, as opposed to future spinal cord, 
creating a very low level of wind signaling by releasing inhibitors and just binding up the wind. So the overlying future neural structures here are going to be exposed to low levels of wind signaling and that's going to push them toward more anterior cell fates. The posterior end will have higher levels of wind signaling. So this will allow future neurons to know where are they? Head, tail, top, bottom. It's just by looking at gradients of diffusible factors. Now the, the final little bit of development uh, is going to be determined more specifically by non-secreted factors, so surface proteins. Okay, let's run through neurulation here, going from a neural plate to a neural tube with ectoderm completely surrounding our nervous system. And this usually works pretty well. When it doesn't, we have spina bifida. Oh, do we already see that? Okay, hold on. Sorry. We're going to start this animation here, and we're going to go through uh, neurulation. So there's that, that primitive streak. All right, so now we're kind of thickening up to form the neural plate. So we've gone through gastrulation. Now we're going to go through neurulation here. So what that's going to look like is this invagination of the swollen future neural tube. So the neural plate there expands. And then there's going to be an inward movement of cells. I'm going to let this finish. So right there it's zippering up, closing the uh, neural tube off. And then it just highlighted some somites. These are going to form uh, musculoskeletal structures at different segments of the embryo there. And there we've got it. So there's the neural tube. More anterior portions are going to form brain structures. Posterior are going to form spinal cord structures. So that neural plate is going to be pulled inward because it's, it's going to be physically attached to the... Uh, notochord. So it can't really shift around, so when we have that inward migration, we're going to have some some kind of building up of the uh, uh, neural, neural folds there. So let me clean this up a little bit. We still have our neural plate. As we continue along, that neural plate is going to have a little bit of an invagination there. Now underlying this, we're going to have our axial mesendoderm that's going to be developing into our notochord. So there it is. Here's that kind of thickened neural plate that's been pulled in. And then we're going to have some interactions right here at the neural folds. So we're somehow going to connect our future nervous tissue and our future skin to each other and pinch them off, leaving us with overlying ectoderm, mm -hmm. that neural tube, and our notochord. So with this, it's going to be interactions between surface proteins at, that, at the neural folds. Whenever this happens, and you know, we, we dissociate the neural tube from skin, it's not perfect. That's a good thing, it's by design. Some cells are going to dissociate from both structures. That's going to be our neural crest. So these neural crest cells here are going to form the ganglia throughout our body, so the peripheral nervous system is going to be derived from that, at least the sensory and postganglionic neurons. So, this could be through homotypic interactions that allows us to break these off. So in amphibians we have NCAMs, those are going to be found in neurons, and NCADherins, formed in neurons as well. NCAMs and, and 
N cadherins stick together. E cadherins and epithelial cells are going to stick to E cadherins. So epithelial cells can only stick to epithelial cells and, and neurons can only stick to, to neurons. It's not quite how it works in mammals, so it's just slightly different but the same idea. Just different, uh, different proteins there. So in this case what we're looking at is uh, efferent and F receptor interactions. So in the epithelial cells here, the reason that these don't stick to neurons but instead stick to uh, epithelial cells is because they have afferent. So here, yeah, that surface protein, afferent. And we also have F receptors. So we have the ligand, and we also have a kinase truncated form of efferent receptors. And what that means is that when F efferent binds to this F receptor, because it lacks a kinase there, it's not going to lead to repulsion. This allows sticking. Neurons don't have efferent in this case, and they have a full length F receptor. They have that kinase that's going to lead to reorganization of the cytoskeleton and repulsion. So neurons can't stick to cells that have efferent, in this case efferent A5. So that, that would mean neurons can't stick to epithelial cells. That's going to allow them to stick to each other, likely with neuron cell adhesion molecules. And then epithelial cells are able to stick to each other through efferent and F receptor interactions. And any neuron that tries to stick to a skin cell with their efferent there, they're going to be repelled. So it's all in the receptor here. Skin's going to have efferent. Future nervous system won't. Because they have kinase truncated versions of F receptor, epithelial cells stick together. And because neurons or future neural cells have the full length, they are going to be repelled by epithelial cells. And so we get then this clean break. So within our neural tube here, in the developing nervous system, we have to figure out which of our lucky contestants goes on to be a neuron. <clears throat> and this is going to come down to delta notch signaling. So uh, we have again the ligand and we have the receptor. Okay, so delta is going to be the ligand. So now we're going to get rid of this junk. And we're going to start to figure out in our now separated future nervous system which cells are going to be the neurons. And we'll put a few future cells here. Because we have to have some cells form epithelia, some form um, uh, glial cells. We can't just have a brain full of neurons. It wouldn't work. So we don't want every cell to become a neuron. Instead we're going to pick out one lucky winner. And the way that we're going to do this is with delta notch signaling. So, uh, delta, surface protein. The receptor is going to be notch. When notch binds to delta, it's going to get cut by gamma secretase. Gamma secretase is going to liberate the N terminal, or sorry, the notch uh, intracellular domain. Notch intracellular domain, so the, the part of notch that's inside the cell. This is a transcription factor. Now, of course, like other transcription factors, it's going to dimerize with some partner. And now we have an active transcription factor, so we can affect gene expression. What we're going to be doing here is stimulating neural repressor genes. 
So, stimulation of notch then prevents the form, the formation of neurons. They will not be neurons. What it also does, in addition to stimulating neural repressors, it's going to inhibit expression of delta. And this is what allows for one winner to take all. So every cell here is going to have some reasonable amount of delta. We'll call it just one. We have a level of one for delta. Now this is going to fluctuate and there will be little deviations and whenever there's a slight increase, whenever one has a little bit more than the others, let me give that one two. What that's going to do is allow it to stimulate notch signaling in its neighbors a little more effectively than its neighbors are stimulating its notch. For example, let's say we have this little notch here and delta's notch here, it's over here. So they have this back and forth. They're kind of uh, level until one starts to come up above the others. So when we see an increase in delta expression just because of noise, what that can do is then cause higher levels of notch signaling in its neighbors. Now, when we stimulate a little more notch over here, keep in mind we're going to decrease delta. So now the amount of delta on our surface decreases. So notch signaling in the neighbors decreases. And since we decrease notch signaling, we're not repressing delta. So we can upregulate the amount of delta in this cell. And it's going to do the same thing in all of its neighbors. What it's going to do is stimulate notch signaling in all the neighbors. So again, gamma secretase is going to cleave that notch intracellular domain in all of the neighbors. This is going to dimerize and then, of course, stimulate the expression of neural repressors and decrease delta all across the board. So only one cell in this lot is destined to be our future neuron. And all the rest are going to have to be something else. This way we don't have a whole bunch of neurons surrounded by no support cells. This allows us to, to have distributed generation of neurons so that they're kind of scattered about. <clears throat> so it's a winner-take-all setup. Once there's a little bit of an increase in one relative to its neighbors, that's going to decrease their delta, amplify its difference. So we'll have very strong levels of uh, neural gene expression surrounded by strong levels of neural repressors. <clears throat> now those transcription factors uh, can be stimulated through surface protein interactions like we see here, but they can also be inherited. So transcription factors can be passed down to help determine cell fate, but when you, when you get down to it, in order to become one type of cell versus another, it all comes down to what transcription factors you have, because that determines what genes you express. Every cell has the same set of genes that it could express, but different types of cells have different phenotypes because they express different genes. Not every gene is turned on in every cell. So those proneural genes, or those neural repressors, whenever we're talking about those, we're of course talking about transcription factors. So the expression of proneural genes, for example, that's going to be 
just the expression of transcription factors that then allow the cell to adopt a neural cell fate. And what I mean there, when we're talking about the, the neural cell fate, that just means you have to look and act like a neuron. And there's a few things that go into that. I just want to touch on two of them here, just to give you an example. So, neurons are post-mitotic. And what that means is that they no longer go through the cell cycle. Now, of course, progression through the cell cycle, we've all learned this. That's going to be dependent on different cyclin-dependent kinases that are triggered by the kind of cyclic expression of cyclins, depending on what phase you are in the cell cycle. So it progresses in a nice linear fashion. So moving through the cell cycle depends all on cyclin-dependent kinases. Now, those proneural genes that are going to be expressed in neurons, one of the things that they upregulate are cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. So they prevent movement through the cell cycle. And this is what makes neurons post-mitotic. It's impossible for them to move through the cell cycle because their cyclin-dependent kinases are tonically inhibited. The other thing that neurons need to do is, of course, make and package and release neurotransmitters. So we'll talk about the formation of synapses in, in its own lecture. But of course, if you're going to be a neuron, you've got to be able to package neurotransmitters into vesicles. So uh, the, the adoption of an excitatory neuronal cell fate then depends on your ability to package glutamate, but not GABA. So the transcription factors that then push toward an excitatory neuronal cell fate, such as the T-cell leukemia homeobox transcription factors, they're going to induce vesicular glutamate transporters. That's going to allow us to package glutamate. And they're going to uh, repress a transcription factor called PAX2 that allows us to express uh, glutamic acid decarboxylase. So that's going to allow us to make GABA, so the GABA synthetic enzyme, no more of that, and VGAT. This might be better if I just write it down. So if we're going to be an excitatory neuron, those T-cell leukemia homeobox transcription factors, they're going to stimulate V-glute, and they're going to then repress this other transcription factor that would allow us to adopt gabaergic sulfate, so the synthetic enzyme, GAD, and the VGATs. So since we're inhibiting that, PAX2 there, no GABA, and no GABA transport. Now, of course, if you're going to be an inhibitory neuron, then you're going to need those high levels of PAX2 so that you can make GABA and stick it into a vesicle. No need to induce V-glute. <coughs> And so in this case, uh, uh, so if we look at these data over on the, on the slide there on the bottom, what they're doing there is just labeling vesicular glutamate transporters, and they're, they're doing so in the uh, TLX knockouts. So they, they knocked out two different versions uh, that are fairly important for uh, development of the cortex. So vesicular glutamate transporters you'll see are largely absent from the developing cortex. So if you compare C, wild type, to D, you'll notice the lack of dark signal, that is V glutes, in the developing cortex. Now there's different transcription factors for neurons in different areas, so we didn't get rid of all of it, but we did, at least in the neurons that rely on TLX1 and 3. Now uh, in these data, what we're looking at is the expression of uh, VGAT, that's that vesicular inhibitory amino acid transporter in the top row. At the bottom we're looking at GAD, the synthetic enzyme. Wild types on the left, the TLX knockouts on the right, and you'll see we have the decrease in uh, V-glutes that we saw before, and that's accompanied by an increase in VGATs and GAD. So we're seeing a lot more inhibitory neurons because we knocked out those transcription factors that stimulate an excitatory cell fate.
Now, what transcription factors we have kind of depends on our neighbors, but it also depends on what mom gave us. And I don't mean our actual mothers, I mean the mother cell. So when, when neurons go through cell division, that mother cell forms two daughter cells. The fate of those daughters depends on what transcription factors they have available. And we don't always give equal transcription factors to the two daughters. We don't always make clones. We can through symmetric cell division. And when it's symmetric, what we mean is we create two identical cells. So those developing uh, neuroprogenitor cells called neuroblasts can divide symmetrically, creating two clones, or they can divide asymmetrically, meaning the two cells are going to be different. Now we're going to have a basal complex and an apical complex. These are two different parts that um, that uh, neuroblast there, if it divides symmetrically, where each cell has a little bit of the apical and a little bit of the basal complex, that's going to give us two more neuroblasts. With the apical complex and the basal complex. However, if they divide asymmetrically, where one cell is going to receive that apical complex and the other receives the basal complex, well then we're going to be left with a future neuron, so that's the ganglion mother cell, that basal complex is going to give us a neural cell, flate, a neural cell fate, and the apical complex is going to prevent neural cell fate We'll eventually recreate our basal complex down here, and we're going to be left then with a, just another neuroblast. So symmetric cell division is going to increase the number of neuroblasts. We go from one to two. Asymmetric cell division is going to recreate the neuroblast and then give us a ganglion mother cell. that apical complex is going to be able to push stuff back over and make the basal complex, as we'll see in just a second. So, of course, whenever we're making neurons, we're going to be going through asymmetric cell division. When we're just expanding the numbers, like whenever we're thickening up that neural plate, that's symmetric. We're not adopting unique cell fates here, we're just expanding our progenitor population. Through asymmetric cell division, we're going to then create two distinct types of cells. We're going to recreate the um, um, neuroblast, so the progenitor cell, and then we're going to also create a ganglion mother cell, a future neuron. So that basal complex, that's what's going to give us a future neuron. What it's going to do, very basically, is inhibit notch signaling. So in the ganglion mother cell, we're going to have notch inhibitors. So we're going to decrease notch. That's going to be through NUM. That's a notch inhibitor. And then we're going to have proneural transcription factors. So we'll make sure that we prevent the expression of neural repressors and we're going to actually have proneural transcription factors that are going to help us get out of the cell cycle and start to express the appropriate uh, neurotransmitter machinery. <clears throat> We're going to be uh, moving these into the basal complex really through, uh, of course, myosin uh, interactions here. So Miranda is an adapter protein that helps bring the proneural transcription factors into the basal complex. We're also removing these from the apical complex to make sure that our apical complex is clear of these proneural components. So what the apical complex is going to do is actually increase notch signaling in a couple of ways. The PAR proteins in the apical complex are going to hold notch receptors there. I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah. We're going to hold notch receptors here, so we'll have high levels of notch in the apical complex.
That's going to make sure that any cell that inherits this will become a neuron. So the PAR proteins are going to help do that. They'll localize notch there to the apical complex. That um, atypical protein kinase C, what that's going to do is help make sure we have a clear distinction. So there's an atypical protein kinase that's held here. What that's going to do is uh, activate myosin 2 to help remove basal complex components. So clear the proneural stuff away to the other side. And the way that it's going to do that is by inhibiting this protein called uh, lethal giant larva, something along those lines, that's a myosin inhibitor. So only portions away are going to have active uh, myosin 2, myosin 2, and myosin 4 are going to help move the basal complex down so we get a clear distinction. We have polar cells. So the reason that we have the polarity is because of myosin. Myosin can't run back into the apical complex because we're going to inhibit it. So it can only be active away from our apical complex. It can only run this direction creating our basal complex. And what the basal complex then does create neurons by having low levels of notch signaling and inheriting some proneural transcription factors. And the reason that we undergo asymmetric cell division is because of inscutable proteins and the partner of inscutable. What they do is turn that mitotic spindle. So rather than orienting in this direction, that apical complex up here, that's going to pull one of those centrioles upward. So if we form our mitotic spindle as such, this will be symmetric. But inscutable and partner of inscutable are going to somehow pull the mitotic spindle up here. So whenever we form our mitotic spindle, we create a midline in this orientation, not this orientation. That then gives us our neuroblast. Proteins in the apical complex will again stimulate myosin to run the basal complex proteins down. And those proteins that inherit the basal complex, they're not going to have uh, notch receptors. Those are all going to be held up here and they're going to have proneural transcription factors that turn them into neurons. Now neurons are going to be created from neural progenitor cells and depending on the type of neuron they're going to come from different types of neural progenitor cells. Now collectively you can call the neural progenitor cells radial glia. We're going to find these in a few different places. We're going to go through development of the cortex very quickly here. In the already developed cerebral cortex. You're going to find six layers. So the outer layer is just neurites, very few cells there. Layers two and three, we're going to have uh, neurons that project to and from other areas of the cortex. <clears throat> layer four is where we get the thalamic input for the most part. It also comes in layer six too. Layer five is where we have our large projection neurons. So these are going to project not to the cortex but to lower structures except for the thalamus. That's layer six. Layer five we hit everywhere else, whether it's the basal ganglia, uh, the brainstem, the spinal cord, that's from layer five. So we got six layers that have kind of unique uh, connection patterns, but within any area of the cortex, those neurons are all going to respond to the same type of, of stimulus. These are what we call cortical columns. <clears throat> yes, you will get input from different areas, whether it be from the cortex or uh, from, from the thalamus, but you're going to deal with the same type of information in each cortical column. Now, the way that we create these columns, or the way that we create these different layers, is by crawling on radial glial fibers. So we're going to build the cortex one layer at a time. So down at the bottom we have our ventricular cells. So here's the ventricle. Right along there we have our ventricular zone. It's the area near the ventricles, that's all that means. 
we're going to build this cortex one layer at a time. Now running from the bottom to the top, we have radial glia. So we'll put our cell body here, and we're going to extend up to the top. All we have is this layer. Newborn neurons are going to pop, pop off of these radial glia through asymmetric cell division, and then crawl along them to settle out here. And of course there's going to be more than one radial glia, but we're going to create a layer of neurons right up there near the top. Now the next layer is going to be built by elongation of the radial glial fibers, allowing the next layer of neurons to settle a little further out so we'll still crawl along our radial glial fiber and we'll settle somewhere out here. And this will allow us to then create layers of neurons, roughly organized in a similar column because they're derived from uh, the same or a nearby radial glial fiber, so they're likely to have similar transcription factors and create a similar pattern of synaptic connections. This little movie, I hope, is showing you the crawling of a newborn neuron along a radial glial fiber. What it's going to do is extend little projections along that radial glial fiber, kind of like climbing a rope, and it's going to pull itself. We're going to settle at the um, apical portion or the outer portion of the developing cortex. We'll build that layer. We go through another round of cell division. We build the next layer. So those newborn neurons then are going to interact with surface proteins on the radial glial fiber. They can't stick to just any old surface. They need to have the appropriate cell adhesion molecule. So what the cell does is extend out little fibers and we'll see this a little more when we talk about uh, axon growth. Here's my neuron. We'll put a little radial glial fiber down here. What it's going to do is extend little projections in all directions. It's only going to be able to stick here, so we'll grow in this direction. These are going to be retracted, so those actin filaments will get pulled in by myosin. We'll stick here, so whenever we try to pull, Rather than removing that extension, we're going to pull the whole cell forward and move us up just a little bit. So now the blue portion is where the cell is. This little bit here, that's where it used to be, but it took a little step this way. So we're going to crawl one little bit at a time along this fiber. Now, of course, there's diffusible factors that tell us which way is basal, which way is apical, and we want to move away from basal. So we're not going to really be extending much this way because the cytoskeleton won't be as stable, so we'll only be moving toward the apical, not basal direction. So we're going to be crawling along that radial glial fiber because we can stick. And we're going to be biased toward the apical direction because that's where our cytoskeleton is going to be more stable. So just think of it kind of like climbing a wall. All right, if you're going to climb a wall, you have to have a place where your hand can stick. That's the radial wheel fiber. If you try to put your hand somewhere where it doesn't stick and you can't get a good grip, when you pull, you're not going to actually move your body, you'll just retract your arm. Only in places where you have a good grip will you move your body when you pull. Same thing here. So we stick out actin filaments, we pull them back with myosin. They're only going to stick on the radial wheel fiber, so we're only going to crawl in that direction. We're going to crawl upwards, and we'll be building our cortex one layer at a time. So there you can see, going from left to right, how we're going to be creating different layers of the cortex. And those cells that are born at different times are going to inherit different transcription factors. And that's what's going to give us our six layers with six distinct types of cells there, whether it be large pyramidal neurons, small pyramidal neurons, or even no neurons like the layer 1. All we're going to find there is some glia. This is how we develop our excitatory neurons. The inhibitory neurons have a little bit more to do. They're still going to be created from radial glial fibers. 
but rather than being created locally in the cortex, these are going to be created in more ventral regions called the ganglionic eminences. Those neurons then have to crawl a long distance to finally settle in the cortex. Those neurons also create uh, the subcortical nuclei like the basal ganglia. And when we talk about them, hopefully you'll remember they're derived from the ganglionic eminences. That's where we create our inhibitory neurons. So it's no surprise that the basal ganglia is filled up with almost exclusively inhibitory neurons. So in development, excitatory neurons are created locally, inhibitory neurons are created in the ganglionic eminences, and then they must migrate to their final destination. After we've gone through the whole rigmarole of development, we still continue to create some neurons, but not that many. Adult neurogenesis does occur, but only in about two places. the subventricular zone and the subgranular zone. The subventricular zone creates new olfactory neurons. We have to constantly replenish those because they expose their dendrites to air. That uh, makes them prone to die and thus they need replacement. So we're constantly creating new olfactory sensory neurons. The subgranular zone in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus also creates new neurons, and we think these are probably important for memory formation. And here we can see a newborn neuron. The way they found this is with BRDU labeling. Um, this is a novel nucleotide that can be identified with an antibody. So what they do is bathe the uh, tissue with BRDU this nucleotide only gets incorporated into cells that are synthesizing DNA. So the, the little D and BR, the U, that would be the deoxy. So this is going to be made in DNA, not RNA, <clears throat> even though it's uracil. The only cells that make new DNA would be those who are going through the cell cycle. So when you see high levels of BRDU, that tells you that this cell just made its DNA. So it must be a newborn cell. And there we have one surrounded by mostly not newborn cells. Of course, uh, uh, neurons don't really go through the cell cycle. So the red signal is showing us neuronal nucleotides, that's new N, and then BRDU, the green, is showing us newborn neurons. This is more of an exception uh, than the rule, most neurons aren't newborn. But it still happens, and it probably is an, is an important aspect of memory formation. Hopefully you'll remember uh, this, if anything is kind of tricky, fill out that questions box and we can chat about it in class. I'll see you later.